एक सेकेंड हेलो एंड वेलकम एवरीवन वी आर लाइव ऑन यूट्यूब टुडे टू डिस्कस द की इंपॉर्टेंट एमसीक्यूज टू हेल्प यू एस प्रोसोडोंटिक्स इन योर नेक्स्ट आईएनआई एंड नीट एग्जाम आई एम डॉक्टर रुचि राज योर प्रोसोडोंटिक्स मेंटर फॉर एमडीएस एक्सपर्ट्स बिफोर वी बिगिन टुडे सेशन इट इज कस्टमरी दैट आई इंट्रोड्यूस माई सेल्फ सिंस यू आर मीटिंग फॉर द फर्स्ट टाइम ऑन दिस प्लेटफॉर्म आई माई नेम इज डॉक्टर रुचि आई डिड माई एम डी एस इन प्रोसोडोंटिक्स फ्रॉम ऑल इंडिया इंस्टीट्यूट ऑफ मेडिकल साइंसिस न्यू डेली it's been almost more than 10 years that i have been solving and preparing with mcqs i started my journey about 10 11 years back and then i went ahead to do my masters in prostho after which i also continued teaching and guiding students with neat preparation and mds preparation this is something that i have been doing since last 5 years this is for the first time that we are meeting on this platform and my aim for today's session is just one thing i should give you some topics or some guidance to help you secure your prosto questions for your next exam so let's begin today now if we see prosto as a subject and while i was preparing for your prosto uh, key mcqs to discuss for this particular session i went through about mcqs of prosto in the last 5 years i was going through neat papers and ini names papers and if you study prosto over a course of last 5 to 6 years you would see certain trends in topics and questions that have been asked in the exam they may not necessarily be the same repeat questions but they do come from the similar topics so the goal of today's session or goal of this particular live session that we are doing on youtube is what mainly to familiarize you with these topic and sessions so that if particularly a new question comes but comes from the same family of topic you are able to confidently answer it in your exam right so first before starting my analysis of this particular subject over the last 5 years i would like to just briefly touch upon how prostho is as a subject now all of you are very well aware that we do prepare about 20 subjects for our neat mbs exam and the biggest mistake that we can do is over prepare a subject or get overwhelmed by the vastness of a subject now as far as prostho is considered i would consider it to probably one of the biggest or largest subjects of dentistry per se we start teaching it from first year of bds we continue it till final year we practice it in internship and still there are sections of prosto that we absolutely do not even touch or go much into details in our graduation days such as implants maxillofacial occlusion etc so all in all we know there are various subsections of prosto from which questions can come potentially in our exams but if you carefully judge and see how prosto has been taken up in these exams what we observe over the last 5 year is that there is basically complete and partial denture oriented questions that we see in our exam that does not mean that everything comes from this but if we have to calculate 60 to 70% of weightage is primarily given to complete and partial denture mainly the concepts that are there in this particular section of prosto that is what we have seen as trends in the last 5 years however if you come towards the recent times that is say c papers of 2020 to 22 nowadays questions are being asked from topics that are currently more practiced in prosthodontics such as implantology or uh, splints or management of tmd etc so one or two questions or even more questions are penetrating nowadays and breaching and coming as prostho questions but the mainstay of your prostho uh, preparation relies or depends on how well you know your core concepts of complete and partial dentures as well as fixed prosthodontics what my analysis says over the last 5 years is that you see a variety of questions coming from complete and partial dentures their paper is mainly directed towards them if i pinpoint and tell you specifically you can open up neat 2019 paper and you see a lot of rpd questions coming in the exam 
FPD, what I have observed are mainly basic straightforward questions, nothing something that requires too much of, uh, would you say, uh, beating, uh, too much of understanding or something that is complicated. They are straightforward questions. But nowadays we see a lot of implants, maxillofacial, even TMD questions being asked in your exams. So one or two such questions are being asked. My goal of today's session, mainly I've divided it into three main parts. First is to explain you my analysis of this particular topic or this particular subject as such when you're preparing for need. So this was my analysis of last five years. Then I want to walk you through certain MCQs, mainly which I've seen are coming from a a uh, sub, sub branch or a family of certain topics that are very frequently repeated in the last five to six years. By solving those MCQs, what we are basically doing is we are trying to build and generate core concepts around these topics, which will never fail. We'll always remember them. And if a new question comes from the same family of topic, we would be very confidently able to answer those questions in our next exam. The third part of today's session is what? Lastly, to guide you how to tackle prostho as a subject or how to prepare prostho as a subject for your need. And if you are final year student, I'll give you certain tips to prepare prostho right from your final year BDS so that you can just ace your prostho in any MCQ exam that you're appearing, right? So this was my analysis of prostho over last five years, mainly complete and partial denture oriented, basic questions from FPD. Recent times has seen you know, some questions coming from implant, maxillofacial, management of TNB. Does that mean that we base our entire preparation on implants now? No. When we, whenever we are targeting certain exams like this, our goal is to prepare what has been largely asked and not something which is very less frequently asked, right? The goal of today's session is also to orient you to certain topics that are very frequently asked right and you gain the maximum value by preparing such topics so if i prepare one topic and i expect more questions to come out of it the value that i'm getting by preparation of that topic increases so the purpose of this session that we are doing a purpose of these past sessions also that we have done on mds experts is to give you a bunch of topic make you familiarize with the trends that are going on in the subject so you get the maximum value in terms of mcq answers out of your preparation right so let's begin with starting some MCQs and discussing them so you get an idea of what I'm trying to convey now we have seen very frequently questions coming from MCQ in complete dentures in Facebook also a lot of questions coming in FPD as well as occlusion from Facebook and its concepts surrounding Facebook now the majority of the questions I'll read out the MCQ for you it says that the maxillary cast was mounted on an articulator using a Facebook transfer to increase the vertical dimension by five millimeters what will you do just a second okay so we have a question here so increasing the vertical dimension by five millimeters phase four transfer has been done our mcq options are increase the vertical dimension of occlusion by five millimeters directly record the new centric relation with occlusion record at original dimension the keyword here is original dimension reset condyla guardians on the articulator only and record jaw relation at the new dimension in remark now the first query that or the first feedback that i got from one of our students while doing one such session about a year back was that if the question is pertaining to facebook now there are no silly questions and this was a very good question in fact if the question is pertaining to facebook then the question was ma'am facebook is used for orientation jaw relation why are we talking about vertical dimension here we read that facebook is mainly used for orientation jaw relation what is it had has got to do with bd right so this particular question i'll come to the answer later on i'll show you one more specimen of a question surrounding facebook a very simple language question here facebook transfer is required for what purpose doing multiple fixed restorations doing three unit bridges doing partial denture for replacement of anterior teeth or doing single unit crowns right so there is something that Facebook helps us with when we are doing prosthodontic rehabilitation. So let's begin with that first. And I come on to this over here. Right. So I hope everyone's able to see the video here. And uh, 
So see, the goal of any prostodontic therapy or treatment is mainly what? The goal of any prostodontic therapy or treatment is basically to develop occlusal harmony within the musculature, within the dentition and everything. That is the ultimate goal of any prostodontic treatment. To develop occlusal harmony, there can be multiple ways. Now, we see a lot of patients coming in with a treated dentition, pathological attrition, wear of teeth, multiple posterior teeth which are missing. All of this we see and encounter very commonly in our daily practice. Basically, when we rehabilitate a patient, if we are reorganizing our occlusion, if we are reorganizing the existing occlusion scheme or what existing occlusion that the patient has, then in that particular approach, you need to have a face bow transfer done. The reason for that is like in this video over here, right? Now, first I'll show you something this over here. All of you can very well appreciate here that these are mandibular movements that are happening in this particular video. Give focus to the opening section over here. You all can see how mandible is, you can see the pointer I hope, right? So when the mandible is opening and closing here, in the initial opening of mandible, there is rotation and then the mandible translates downwards. You all can appreciate it over here in this particular video. When the mandible is completely closed, there is an initial rotation and then the mandible on further mouth opening will translate downwards. That rotation of mandible occurs around something which is called as a hinge axis. It is an imaginary axis that passes through your condyle around which we assume that a mandible is rotating like this, right? Basic idea of doing a face bow transfer is what? If we are able to transfer that hinge axis and the relation of maxillary occlusal plane that you can see here by my pointer to your articulator, if you can simulate what is there in the patient's mouth and you can transfer it onto your articulator, what you're preparing on the articulator, any restoration will be similar or whatever occlusion you're giving on the articulator will be the same in the patient's mouth. You will not encounter multiple clinical chair side errors and adjustments. So whatever occlusal adjustments or occlusal scheme or occlusal contact points that you're giving or preparing on the articulator, you will find something in very close proximity or very similar to that while inserting that in the patient's mouth. So the number of occlusal errors and clinical chair side time reduces over here. That is the main goal. We are trying to simulate our patient exactly on the articulator. So the whole idea is that if I'm able to duplicate this axis around which my mandible is rotating and simulate it and bring it back onto the articulator, my articulator, as you can see in this second photo here, the yellow one, my articulator will also open and close in the same manner in which my patient is doing. By doing so, I'm having the patient in the absence of the patient. So now whatever I prepare on the articulator, be it whatever restoration on the posterior teeth or anterior teeth or on all of the teeth, it will behave in the same manner in the patient's mouth. By behave, I'm saying it will give me the similar or the same occlusal contact points, the same occlusion and the same scheme. So my chair side adjustment over a period of time or clinical adjustment reduces over there, right? that is the main purpose so this second photo is 100% very important because it helps you visualize and understand what do we try to tell you by hinge axis hinge axis again is this axis that passes through your condyles around which the mandible rotates the whole purpose of transferring this entire or taking these records onto the articulator is to prepare your patient or simulate how your patient has the mandibular mouth opening onto the articulator so when you prepare a restoration on the articulator it behaves in a similar manner and you will get lesser clinical errors into the patient's mouth. Now going back to our presentation here, this is your hinge axis over here. It will pass through the condyles, right? We can visualize it in the sagittal plane. What does a face bow do? Face bow will take certain anatomical reference points and it will transfer this maxillary occlusal plane which is there in relation to the hinge axis onto the articulator. So now if you go back and read the definition, it is a mechanical caliper like device that is used to transfer maxillary occlusal plane with reference to some anatomical reference points and then transfer it back onto the articulator. We obtain it from the patient and transfer it to the articulator. When we read such definitions, I'm 100% sure even when I was a student, I just couldn't understand what is transferring of mandibular occlusion, a maxillary occlusion plane. This means what I just explained. Basically, you want your articulator to be 
similar to how your patient is we want the opening and closing axis to be similar to how your patient is and that is why you make this record is it absolutely essential for our patients no i'll tell you the reason why there are multiple prosthodontic treatments that we execute on a daily basis some treatments are such that we give into the patient's existing occlusion that is called as a confirmative approach of treatment examples of this could be a tooth supported partial denture a single crown a three unit fpd in the cases where we are reorganizing the occlusion where patient's existing occlusion is not favorable and we are reorganizing occlusion cases could be full mouth rehabilitation tooth supported implant supported even your complete dentures that is also a form of full mouth rehabilitation in such a scenario where we are reorganizing our complete occlusion at that point of time you need these records now according the kind of treatment that we do and the sophistication of that treatment that we want we will employ our equipments so our main goal is to reduce the amount of lab side error that we see clinically so in cases of full mouth rehabilitation whether it is tooth or implant supported such records are absolutely must and what we routinely employ for our convenience is a arbitrary facebook so the next question that arises in our student who very frequently practice and do complete dentures is that why aren't we doing it on a regular basis in complete denture i'll tell you the reason first is the a reason is that we do not require that level of sophistication when preparing complete dentures second is that there are multiple portals of creating an error while doing cd i'll give you some examples there are multiple laboratory steps at every laboratory steps you can incorporate some error second reason is that your denture is lying on a soft tissue that has some resilience and compressibility so even if you bring so much of finesse on the lab side it might not translate there clinically second is the third reason is what you are having a cast which is a hard structure but the cast is an impression of something which is a resilient structure so there is a difference over there if you see tooth supported full mouth if you see implant the weight is there in the patient's mouth same will be there on the articulator so the chances of portal of entry of errors are less over here and you need that level of sophistication such scenarios with complete dentures sometimes even the tissue also reorganizes or adjusts if there is a minor error and that is why we don't require that level of finesse in all of the cases we don't do face bow transfers in all case of complete dentures we do it in some selective cases definitely if you can give balancing in your cases it is always very good if you aren't able to you can still adjust it chair side so the gist of all of this is that your equipment choice depends upon the surface sophistication that you require in your treatment and the gist of facebo is what facebo is related to vertical dimension now i'll explain you by taking the mcq look at the mcq here what does it say we want to increase the vertical dimension by 5 mm what does that essentially mean we are giving a treatment in which we are changing the occlusion of the patient whenever we are changing the complete occlusion the first thing that we require is a facebo transfer now there are certain limitations with it If you have made a face bow transfer, the digit five millimeter is super important over here today. If you have made a face bow transfer in a record and you want to change the vertical dimension of occlusion again after making the record by say two millimeters, you don't need to make a new record because within two millimeters it is permissible on the articulator. So the key value here is two millimeters that you need to take into consideration. But if it is more than 2 mm then definitely you need to make a new record so the correct answer of this entire mcq over here is this particular option record jaw relation at the new dimension and then remount it so if you feel you want to increase the vertical dimension by 5 mm make a new set of records make a new face bow transfer interocclusional records and then again remount if the same here was say 1.5 mm only then the option would be you have to do it at the original dimension and rather you don't need to make any original records or new records you can just simply raise it raise your pin on the articulator by 1.5 mm and you'll be done with it coming on to the next question of facebo which i had taken up in the uh, next slide was that facebo transfer is required for now you would be able to answer here it is definitely required for multiple fixed restoration the reason is this is the only one where we are reorganizing our occlusion this is all confirmative approach of treatment right that means we are just treating the patient in his or her same occlusion we are not changing the entire occlusional scheme this only 
one option is an outlier here where it shows that is it's going to reorganize the occlusion that is why we need a facebook transfer i hope this particular section is clear now we see multiple questions with facebook why is it required what is its relation with vertical dimension what does it exactly transfer how many millimeters are permissible i have covered everything that surrounds complete denture occlusion full mouth the whole concept of pro facebook i have tried my best to concise it within 5 to 10 minutes and try to explain you here if you still have any doubts please put down your queries in the chat box below i can take it up at the end of the session right so that was the first question that i've seen very commonly coming from complete dentures second is vertical dimension now vertical dimension i'll call it the most favorite baby of your examiners the reason is that you will 100% find questions around vertical dimensions it was there in a recent i and i recall if you have not seen the video go back to mds experts youtube channel find down the video on prosthor recall and you will see that we have discussed this particular question over there also vertical dimension is something that we have seen probably in every alternate paper some questions surrounding vertical dimension right questions are very simple but you need to have a clarity on what exactly vertical dimension is apart from this clinically if i have to give a tip to you it is 100% very important to have a fair working understanding of vertical dimension so that it helps you deliver better restorations to your patients be it an endodontist or prosthodontist if you're giving a restoration if you are practicing restorative dentistry 100% you should know what vertical dimension is so let's understand it today we'll try to clear all confusions today and try to understand what vertical dimension is right so the question here says that when a denture is closed a patient makes a clicking sound right the important point here is clicking sound while performing functional movements there are some potential causes what are they could it be after relining of dentures could it be because of reduced interocclusal space could it be horizontal displacement of mandibular denture or could it be interocclusal space now what i gain as an information from here is that when the patient is doing functional movements opposing dentures are clicking this clearly means that we have lesser interocclusal space or distance between both of the dentures so clear cut answer becomes option number b reduced interocclusal space coming to the next question surrounding vertical dimension which we have seen is according to the framing of symptoms either they'll give you some clinical symptom or they'll give you some value but usually it is around troubleshooting of complete dentures and some problem that the patient brings in or some facial feature that the patient has either it is a sign or a symptom that is usually presented in the question and then it pops as a question here second question also what the patient reports is with symptoms of tmj pain discomfort and clicking sound intraoral evaluation would reveal what now they are asking what intraoral evaluation would reveal patient has tmj pain patient has discomfort and clicking sound now tmj pain and discomfort is very vague it is present in both whether there is an increase in vd or decrease in vd clicking is something that is very particular this is a very specific uh symptom that the patient comes with right so when there is clicking there should be reduced interocclusal space that becomes our option and the correct answer now for all of you who do not understand the concepts around vertical dimension don't worry i have included over here right what essentially vertical dimension means it is the distance between your maxillary and mandibular jaw as you measure between two anatomical reference points usually the points that are selected are the tip of the nose and the tip of the chin right now there are two aspects of vertical dimension there is something which is called as vertical dimension at rest there is something which is called as vertical dimension at occlusion right what is vertical dimension at rest first of all we'll understand that vdr is what when your mandible is in a state of physiological rest as all of you are sitting right now you are in a state of physiological rest your mandible is in rest position when i measure the space between these two anatomical landmarks whatever distance that i get that is my patient's vertical dimension at rest can i alter it no you cannot alter it it is not presented in our textbooks in this manner but in a very layman terms such as to just explain you you cannot alter the patient's vertical dimension at rest what you however can do is alter or restore patient's vertical dimension at occlusion now i'll give you one exercise to do all of you be with me all of you are in physiological rest position try to bring your teeth in occlusion that means try to occlude your teeth i'm 100% sure all of your mandibles went up 
that means there was some space between both of your jaws and then your mandible went up and then your mandible closed basically so where your mandible is occluding or intercuspating the space or the distance that lies between these two anatomical reference points that is called as vertical dimension at occlusion simple the measurement of distance between these two anatomical reference points when teeth are occluding or intercuspating that is vdo so vdr is when mandible is at rest position VDO is when mandible is in occlusion, when teeth are occluding with each other and the space that lies between both of them that is called as our freeway space, right? So that is our freeway space now. Naturally, all of you closed your mandible and went upwards. Logically, that means what? VDO is less than VDR. So the equation that becomes is VDR equals VDO plus freeway space. It is very, very evident over here. This is a rest position. You can see some space lying in between. This is where the mandible is closed and you can see some gap or some difference over here, right? That is essentially your freeway space. I'm 100% sure all of you would be thinking this is very easy Why are you explaining us this, right? But this is very important concept to understand is that VDR is something that we cannot actually change in a patient because this is a dimension of how your facial structure musculature, bone, etc. or how your jaws are basically. That is exactly how your jaw are related to each other. That is your VDR. What we can do is that when your patient is missing this tooth component over here, when we restore our patient to the correct vertical dimension, we are essentially establishing what? You need to understand this. We are essentially establishing VDO. I'll write it down over here somewhere where you can see. We are essentially establishing VDO, vertical dimension of occlusion is something that we established. Vertical dimension of rest is something that we measure from our patients. And then we keep our freeway space in between and we establish what is called as VDO, vertical dimension of occlusion, right? So when we say or when a question mentions raising vertical dimension, it is essentially telling you to raise VDO because you cannot alter VDR. There is no possibility you can do that. So you're essentially raising vertical dimension of occlusion. I'll clear one more myth today. We do not raise vertical dimension. We just restore it to the correct VDO. So there is nothing like raising vertical dimension. We are always restoring it to the correct VDO. Patient when loses teeth, loses vertical dimension of occlusion. When we restore it correctly to the correct vertical dimension, we are basically restoring our VDO. That is what we are doing, right? And the space that lies between them, that is called our freeway space. So when we go forward to our first question that we saw over here, and it was stating raising the vertical dimension by five millimeter, what are we raising? We are raising our VDO. We are raising our vertical dimension of occlusion. Or if you want to be slightly more sophisticated with prostho and impress your professors, do tell we are restoring vertical dimension. We are not raising vertical dimension, right? So that is what we are doing. What happens if we do mistakes in adjusting the video? Mistakes do happen. We are clinicians every day. We can do some mistakes. This is what happens that I am summarizing here from which your plethora of questions with regards to increased interocclusion space, decreased interocclusion spaces are coming, right? So come and try to understand this. This is our normal patient at the correct VDO, right? Now, supposedly, I'll write down the equation over here and I'll try to explain it with numbers. VDO plus freeway space. Supposedly, my VDR was 60 millimeters and my VDO I have set at say supposedly 60 millimeters only. I forgot to keep any freeway space, right? So what have I done? I have increased the vertical dimension of occlusion by at least 2 millimeters here, right? Because the ideal value of freeway space is roughly two to four millimeters. If I keep the bottom half of it or keep the bottom limit of it, I'll keep it at two millimeters. So I forgot, say I made a mistake or say my denture became thick after curing. So my VDO has increased, right? And now my VDO is equaling VDR. So I'm losing freeway space. I don't have a freeway space. What you will see essentially is this patient. First and foremost, Imagine supposedly and do it with me simultaneously. Say supposedly the condition in which your mouth is occluding right now, just slightly open it up by two to three millimeters and observe yourself in front of the mirror. The first thing that you see is stretched facial appearance. 
low facial height will increase or will look stretched facial musculature looks stretched second thing that the patient comes with is discomfort not pain the second thing that the patient comes with is a sense of discomfort as if something is high in the mouth third thing that the patient comes with is there is no rest to the tissue so the tissues will sli slightly show inflammation at first over a period of time they will have hyperemia and then there will be an accelerated resorption of bone because you are not giving any rest to the tissue they are constantly in occlusion try to bite on your teeth and hold it continuously in that position you will not be able to do it because you are not giving rest to your musculature freeway space basically is aimed to giving rest to your periodontal structures and associated musculature when you are not doing any functional activity so when you are eliminating freeway space by mistake by giving more video what essentially done is kept the patient in occlusion only by doing so what has happened is that there is a stretched appearance of the face lower facial height increases patient comes with a complaint of discomfort patient comes with a complaint of pain in the denture base uh, region as in the denture bearing tissue region patient comes with hyperemia accelerated resorption over a period of time patient comes with clicking of dentures because now there is no freeway space so you will see a landmark feature over here i'll write it down which is clicking this is not seen in the other one so you have to remember that clicking is exclusive when you increase video right when you have increased video and you have omitted your freeway space then you will see clicking because now they are close proximity to each other so even the patient if he moves the mouth slightly they'll just click against each other right that is how clicking us what happens over a period of time this problem in the tmj right the first thing that you see is problem in the tmj if it is unresolved over a longer period of time you will see accelerated resorption of bone you will see continuous pain you will see patient not having a sense of comfort with the dentures there's a sense of restlessness with it there's continuous clicking and over a period of time you will see tmj changes so when you are asked a question what increased video would do the first thing that you answer is not tmj changes the first thing that you answer is discomfort then you say pain then you say denture bearing area will be sore then you say hyperemia resorption and then eventually tmj issues will occur in these patients next complaint that the patient comes immediately is difficulty in swallowing right because when the teeth are constantly in occlusion they will have difficulty in swallowing there is no freeway space over there right so that these different consequences are framed as something among sign or symptom and then asked to you in exam this happens very frequently around vertical dimension so keep this in mind now what happens if you do not restore the video to the correct height and you keep it slightly less so vdr say supposedly again was 60 but now what i did was i kept my video at say supposedly 52 and i've kept a freeway space of say 8 millimeters so essentially what i've done is i've restored the patient to a wrong vertical dimension of occlusion which is less so that means i have more freeway space between my dentures do you think that would be beneficial no what happens is now patient has to do rotation of mandible and over close the mandible so as to bring the teeth in occlusion so you'll see a protrusion of chin when the chin will protrude and patient over closes the mandible you see something like this wrinkling around the mouth you will see folds forming around the mouth you will see an edentulous appearance nobody wants to be visualized as an edentulous patient even after wearing the dentures even after going through the pain of wearing dentures right so you see such a edentulous toothlet toothless appearance of your patient when you are uh, restoring it to the wrong vertical dimensions which is lesser than what actually it should be next thing what you see is patient has poor masticatory efficiency because he has to over close the mandible the bite force generated is very less so there the complaint would be i am not able to eat with this denture right that will be the next set of complaint because there are folds forming around the mouth the next thing that you again notice in this patient is angular chelitis then you will see blockage of eustachian tube also and pain discomfort tmj issues that are there with both of the scenarios but if you are reading the consequences of increased video and decreased video you have to remember these landmark uh, signs and symptoms which is clicking in an increased video angular folds edentulous appearance 
protrusion and chin rotation in a decreased video blockage of eustachian tube again very specific feature of decrease in video so i hope this topic is clear to you you have understood what actually video means with vdr is something that we do not actually restore we just obtain it as a value from the patient we restore the patient to the correct vdo and not vdr freeway space is something that should be 2 to 4 millimeters applicable to all of your prosthodontic rehabilitation treatment right so that was the main purpose of introducing vd to you am i trying to say that cd is only from these topics no there is a long list of such important topics and trends but then why am i giving weightage to it because when we are preparing for competitive exams what do we want we want the maximum output or maximum value from the minimum most effort that we are doing that is why we at mds experts what we do is that we try to segregate such topics prepare them nicely so your basic of your preparation is done and then we take you to certain topics which could be probably asked and refine your preparation right coming to the third topic from complete dentures this is an mcq that i have solved even when i was a student i have seen it coming from since last 15 years or even more than that you can open up uh, question papers from the era of 2005 and you will still find this mcq which is something about labial dental sounds that your examiner loves a lot now there's one more thing about mds preparation that i want to highlight that is why i have kept this mcq first phonetics in complete denture a question in your final bds exam i am sure most universities don't ask it as a question do your examiners ask you labial dental sounds fricatives consonants in viva no there's much more to ask like impressions correlations so the point of all of this is what what could be very important for university exam as a syllabus in final bds may not necessarily have that value for mds preparation so that is why you need to have proper guidance of such topics of what exactly you need to prepare and again gain maximum value out of your minimum most effort that you're putting right so let's take up this question super important question but a very straightforward question is anterior teeth position causes change mainly in which sound it causes change in labio dental sound right mainly your labio dental sound mainly your labio dental fricatives which is your sound f and w first of all you never call it c h s f and t it is f and w that is your labio dental sound now why does it do problems with labio dental sound i'll just show you over here what happens in labio dental sound now as the name suggests labio dental means what the tooth and the lip are meeting and that is how articulation of this particular sound is done that is why it is called as labio dental sound examples of it are what f and v sounds now when your lip when your teeth would touch the vermilion of the lower lip the posterior one third of the vermilion of your lower lip that is when these sounds are prepared that is how articulation of these sounds happen if your anterior teeth this is very important remember if your anterior teeth are too far short right i'm trying to write short over here short v will sound more like f right and if your anterior teeth in the anterior posterior or superior sorry superior inferior plane that means placing it slightly up or down in relation to occlusal plane if you are too far long for sound it will sound more like v that is how it works mainly for and v these sounds are related to superior inferior position of anterior teeth and anterior posterior position of anterior teeth if your teeth are too far down below towards the occlusal plane that means they are too far long for will sound more like v if they are too far up in the occlusal plane v will sound more like f the ideal is where your tip of the incisor would be touching the vermilion posterior one third of your lower lip that is the ideal position of these teeth that to verify it at the stage of trying right this is a very 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 important mcq question that has been time and again repeatedly asked in papers these are questions that if you make mistakes in i'm sorry i don't know whether or not you will get your best ranks that you're aiming at but you should never be making mistakes in such questions so there is a whole um, discussion of phonetics in complete denture that i could take probably for an hour or two hours but out of that what has been very frequently asked are labio dental sounds either they'll be in the form of 
asking you what happens if I place the tooth like this or they'll be in this form. But question do come from phonetics in complete denture, either bilabial sounds or labiodental sounds. It was not a very important topic when you are doing in your university exams, but it is 100% a very important topic when you're doing it right now for your MDS preparation, right? Coming to the next question that is pertaining to RPD, we'll try to increase our speed slightly over here, is direct retainer situation in distal extension. Very confusing for students actually to understand what direct retainer to give in a distal extension situation. Let us understand the mechanism here. All of you are aware this is a Kennedy, say I'm assuming a Kennedy class one situation, which is also called as a distal extension situation, right? When I engage the mesiobuccal undercut, that is away from the edentula space, right? And when I do that, and when the clasp will engage at the mesobuccal undercut, somewhat like this, I have a distal occlusal rest and a mesobuccal undercut I'm engaging. Whenever any occlusal load or effort is applied onto the denture, the tooth will rotate around its center of rotation and it will have a tendency to tip towards the backside into the edentula space. That is what is uh, happening according to class one lever principle. It is also called as bottle opener principle, right? So our idea when we are giving a direct retainer for a distal extension case is to avoid incorporating or using the mesiobuccal undercut unless and until it is absolutely essential, right? The reason is that the tooth will have a tendency to tip into the edentula space by following class, by following your class one lever principle. So we try to engage the undercut, which is usually on the distal side or we engage something which is mid buccal. So the choice of direct retainer assembly mainly is your bar clasp or it is your I-bar assembly or RPI system that would engage the distal undercut or you could use something which is called as the reverse circlet class which also engages the distal undercut or undercut that is adjacent to the edentula space. Mesial undercut is usually engaged by combination class. If we see that is a rod wire class pump that will engage the mesial undercut. So now if we come back to a question, in a Kennedy class one, all of the following clasps used engage undercut close to the edentulous area, except so you're asking something that is away from the edentulous area. It would be your, what should be bar class will be close to the edentulous area. And your reverse circlet class will also be close to the edentulous area, right? In a Kennedy class one, all of the following clasps use engage undercut close to the edentulous area, except your combination class, it will engage it away from the edentulous area. Usually it engages your mesial undercut that we are doing, right? And uh, embrasure class, we don't preferably use it like that. Now, if I want to show you some pictures, actually, this is how the whole scenario is in a distal extension. And this is how it is in a tooth supported scenario. In a tooth supported scenario, where there are not many movements, rotary movements happening around the axis, or there's no fulcrum forming for movement, there, the undercut that is away from the edentula space, that means over here and the undercut over here, that will be engaged and the rest will be lying adjacent to the edentula space. So you should get an idea that the terminology used while describing direct retainers is that undercut away from the edentulous area, undercut next to the edentulous area. So if we see a class three situation, occlusal rests are adjacent to the edentulous area. Undercut which is engaged is away from the edentulous area, right? So just to summarize, these lines are super important for you. In placement in distal extension cases, mesial side of the abutment tooth is usually, that is what is preferred if we want to engage or give a circumferential clasp assembly. Distal of the abutment tooth is not preferred for an occlusal rest, right? Because it might act as a bottle opener and elevate the tooth on biting. If you're doing it in tooth supported cases, you put it on the distal of the anterior tooth. So you can see the situation here, distal surface of the anterior tooth over here, and you put it on the mesial surface of the posterior tooth here. That is the placement of the occlusal rest. And then away from the edentulous area should be your clasp assembly that is engaging the undercut. So briefly, if I tell you, you mainly use bar clasp, I bar, RPI assembly, all infra bulge clasps that are towards the edentulous area that engage the undercut adjacent to the edentulous area for your uh, distal extension scenario. 
if by chance there is a soft tissue undercut which does not allow you to use infra pulse clasp assembly the next thing that you can move on is a reverse circlet clasp this will also put a mesial mesial occlusal rest and undercut will be on towards the edentulous side or you could go for a combination clasp assembly briefly these are the only uh, direct retainer assemblies for distal extension very confusing topic but if you do understand how lever principle works and how does this tooth tip and why do we not give a distal occlusal rest and why don't we engage the meso, mesial undercut for this particular case by a standard circumferential clasp. If you understand this bottle opener principle in class 1, it will become very important for you or rather very easy for you to answer questions pertaining to direct retainer assembly. Reason why we incorporated this here is what? The indications of component is the primary or mainstay of asking questions from RPD. So that is why we are doing that. Implants, very easy, rather very simple things are asked in implants is anatomical landmarks. How much distance should you keep from anatomical landmarks? What are the different components that you used in exam? In the recent INI recall also, there was a question pertaining to abutment. What exactly abutment means, right? So we'll quickly take up the first question. Most important factor for implant placement is what? To have inter-implant distance to be 3 millimeters, more than 10 millimeters of length, diameter should be ideally 5 millimeter or diameter depends on CJ. Most important thing that you have to find from your question is, it is asking you most important factor for implant placement. That means during the surgery, then the answer becomes this. You have to maintain a 3 millimeter inter-implant dis uh, distance when you're doing any implant surgery. Minimum of 3 millimeters is absolutely essential. Minimum of 1.5 millimeters is absolutely essential between implant and natural tooth. Whether you have a natural tooth and then you're placing an implant next to it, minimum of 1.5 millimeters, minimum of 0.5 to 1 millimeters from your buccal and lingual plate, minimum of 2 millimeters from mental foramen or any bony, any canal that is your inferior canal or any vessel that is going. Try to avoid the midline of the maxilla because that is where from your vessels come out, right? These are a few things that are asked from implants. The next set of questions, see this is also an example, minimum gap between two implants should be at least 3 millimeters and the next set of questions is around very basic things in implant. What is a crystal bone loss that you usually see in the loading of an implant? Usually we see 1.5 to 2 millimeters around an implant and what is again seen very commonly in implants are component questions. Now components is very basics of implants. So briefly if I have to tell you, I've just included one slide. Photos are not my original, they are all from textbooks or internet sources. This is from your standard textbook MISH for implantology. You see something like this which is made out of titanium having threads or screws. This is called as an implant body or fixture or screw that goes completely inside your bone. Over that, you put something, after putting the implant body, you put something which is called as your cover screw, right? What is a cover screw? You're basically closing the hole of the implant over there so that tissue does not grow inside during the healing phase and osteointegration happens nicely. Once your cover screw is covered, you have closed it, you see it after three months to see whether the integration has occurred. Once the integration has occurred, you do something which is called as a stage two surgery. By stage two surgery, we are opening it up and conditioning the tissue surrounding it. So we put something which helps with healing of tissue around it. That is called as a healing abutment, right? So you can see over here, see this particular thing. This is called as your healing abutment, right? Once you have put in your healing abutment onto your implant, you let it sit for say about a week or 10 days, the around surrounding tissue will be adjusted to it and then the cuff of the gingival tissue will be formed. Over that you put something for impression which is called as transfer coping or an impression coping. It comes of two different varieties, open tray and closed tray. That is a separate topic to discuss. If permissible, we can take it sometime later on YouTube. So you will have an open tray or closed tray impression post. Its main purpose is to transfer the angulation of the implant which is there present in the patient's mouth onto a cast. So you attach your impression post onto the uh, implant body, whether it is closed or open tray, use a specific tray and impression material, load it, make the impression. Now when you take it out, you want something to act like as an implant into the cast that you're pouring. So you put something which is called as an implant analog that represents your implant in the cast and that is what this particular structure is, that is your analog. 
like this you attach it to the impression post and then you put it and pour your cast over it over that then you put your standard abutments or angled abutments different varieties of abutments and abutment screws are there to fix the abutment over which you can prepare your standard crown bridge or any full mouth restoration that you're doing so this is a brief about different components we saw one question coming in your recent ini paper regarding abutment that is why we included this here next thing that i want to cover is from fpd what i have seen is mainly questions are around principles of tooth preparation pontics and finish line do i tell you to read this only no you have to start your preparation with these important topics you have to read everything else also but keep your focus on these topics principles of tooth preparation pontics finish lines now i was going to discuss pontics today but pontics is something that i did cover in my ini recall video so that is why we incorporated finish lines today all of you are very well aware finish line is what it is the terminal portion of your tooth preparation a distinction between your prepared and your unprepared tooth right when we do crown preparation finish line is selected according to the material that we are using and according to the aesthetic outcome also that we want out of the case right so that is the selection process that goes behind a finish line so if you are using metal the metal can be burnished in thinner sections so you need only 0.5 to 1 mm that is why a chamfer is used if you are doing porcelain porcelain is a very brittle material all ceramic is a brittle material it requires bulk for strength so you require a shoulder finish line which is approximately say 1 to 2 millimeters thick right so coming to finish lines during crown preparation 0.3 to 0.5 millimeters width of finish line remains what material would you use here so they have changed the question and they are giving you value of the finish line and telling you to decide the material 0.3 and 0.5 directly correlates to casted metal it can be burnished very nicely at the margin and adaptation can be very nice so that is one question second is gingival finish line on a tipped molar now when a molar is angulated slightly it is difficult to traverse this undercut and prepare over here if you do remove this undercut you are going to over prepare the tooth so you give a very thin finish line which is usually your feather edge finish line on a tipped molar so that is again a very important question the choice of finish line on a tipped molar should be what it should be a feather edge finish line and lastly this particular segment of question from finish line is very common you have a maxillary first molar on the buccal side we are going to give a pfm process is what is the choice of finish line we usually prefer either shoulder or shoulder with bevel the reason for giving bevel is what if there is any unsupported enamel that will be removed and that is an advantage while giving bevel so briefly if i tell you chamfer is usually indicated for all cast metal restorations deep chamfer you can give for porcelain veneers you can use shoulder for where you are using complete ceramic where the margin portion is going to be prepared in ceramic then you can give in pfm restorations all ceramic when you find cases where you have unsupported enamel where you see that a ledge has been formed you can create a bevel over there to give a shoulder with bevel if there are special cases like tipped molars you can then give something which is called as a knife edge or a feather edge or a chisel edge there are variations of each other depending upon the clinical case much more in details is something that i would want to cover if time permits so we can see if we can plan more sessions like this alternatively you can take actually subscription of e gurukul on our application and join us for live as well as recorded sessions to get a better deeper understanding of the subject that will help you through your final bds through your internship also and help you secure a very nice seat in your exam coming to our last question for our session i see it's almost 754 i've taken an hour out of you but these were very important and i wanted to do justice to your topics right so maxillofacial very straightforward questions are coming they also understand that you do not come across maxillofacial patients on day in and day out basis so if you want to summarize maxillofacial into one thing or most important thing the first word that comes to our mind is what obturators so naturally the question that comes out of maxillofacial is to classify the obturator and something which is very important and asked in exam is a armani classification for obturators now briefly tell you what an obturator does is if there is a maxillectomy defect or sometimes even a mandibulectomy defect and a space form it obturates or seals the defect to maintain the continuity of the hard palate 
By doing so, what it does is it prevents ingress of food, water, saliva inside. It maintains continuity. It gives you a palate over which you can push and swallow. Try to swallow without touching your palate. It would be very difficult. So you get a roof against which you can push and swallow, right? There are three phases of treatment in obturator, surgical, interim, and definitive. Again, that is a question that is asked in the exam. But chances of it coming in your exam are lesser than your Armani classification. So briefly, We'll just describe what Armani classification is. If you see Armani class 1, it is a midline resection that you do. You resect your maxilla from midline onwards. The other side is unaffected. Those natural teeth can help you with rehabilitation. So something that is from the midline that you do, that is your Armani class 1. If you have a unilateral resection on the same side without touching the anteriors, then you have Armani class 2, a unilateral maxillary resection on the same side without touching the anteriors, that is Armani class 2. Now, if you are not resecting any of the tooth portion and just resecting the center of the heart palate, that is the central portion, you have Armani class 3, right? If, however, your resection line crosses the midline and goes on to the other side, incorporates some of the anterior teeth on the other side, then it is an Armani class 4 resection. If you have an exclusive posterior resection, that means anterior are preserved in the mouth, you are doing a posterior resection, that is Armani class 5. And if you have an exclusive anterior resection, that is Armani class 6. Now, matching this particular classification with the image over here, this is how questions are modified. Sometimes they won't show you the defect side. They'll show you the denture or the obturator and tell you to identify. So don't get confused seeing the tooth. The tooth is the natural tooth where there are artificial teeth missing. That is where your area is missing. So if you see this particular resection is crossing the midline over here. So this becomes Armani class 4, right? This is Armani class 4 as I have shown it over here. That is your Armani class 4 classification. So this brings us to the end of the discussion of different MCQs. The main goal of today's discussion was to make you aware with certain trends that I've followed or that I've observed over a period of time in the last five or seven years. Do I tell you that these are the only topics you are supposed to prepare? Absolutely no. But you can start your preparation here. The reason is what? You have to first secure your basics or you have to secure something that comes very commonly like known as repeat questions. And then you go onwards to something that is less frequently asked. That is how you refine your preparation. And one tip that I promised our students who are doing final BDS is that start solving MCQs from your final BDS. Invest in any question bank that you like. We also have a question bank at MDS Experts. Invest in any question bank that you like and start training your mind to solve MCQs from final BDS. I'm 100% sure you'll get a PG seat in your first go. That is how it works. So again, just signing off telling you one thing. Strategies work in exam to get ranks, not luck or not anything else. It is only strategies that help us with our exams. That is all from me for today's YouTube session. I hope you all enjoyed it. If you have any comments, queries, suggestions, anything that you want me to improve, or if you did like this session, please take a moment to put it down in the comment box below. I'll highly appreciate it. That will help me grow teaching and helping. I've always loved teaching. I would love to read your comments. So that is all from me today. If you do put in some queries, I'll come back tomorrow and I'll respond to your queries. Queries, don't worry in the same chat box keep checking your queries go back to our INI recall session also to understand different topics like this and if you do like our mode of teaching consider joining MDS experts for your MDS preparation we have different modules that can help you right so that is all for today signing off from here thank you and bye bye